Before you listen, if you enjoy the stories and want to hear more, then please consider subscribing. Most of you listening aren't subscribed, so please take this time to subscribe. Turn on notifications so you'll never miss a story and be the first to hear. You'll also be supporting me. Thank you. I cannot believe I let my coworker Edward talk me into going out with him. He seemed perfectly nice when he asked me out last week at the office. I should have trusted my instincts, though. This date was a total nightmare from start to finish. The bad vibes started as soon as Edward picked me up in his dirty, cluttered car. I could tell he was one of those guys who just throws trash on the floor and never cleans anything. Trying not to judge, I carefully sat down, moving a pile of junk out of the way. That's when the smell hit me. Edward clearly had not showered or applied deodorant in quite some time. The stench of body odor overwhelmed me. I tried discreetly rolling down my window for fresh air without him noticing. No dice. This was going to be the long night. We drove to the restaurant with Edward blasting bad 90s music the whole way. I politely nodded along while internally cringing at his taste in tunes. When we arrived, Edward proceeded to be incredibly rude to our server. First he complained that his water wasn't cold enough and set it back not once, but twice. Next he criticized the menu options, interrogating the poor server about how each dish was prepared. I shrank down in my seat, mortified by his behavior, but unsure how to make it stop without causing a scene. They got worse once our food came out. Edward took one bite of his pasta and called over the manager to demand it be remade because it was completely inedible. At this point, I wanted to crawl under the table and pretend I was dining alone. The manager calmly apologized and had the dish redone, even though there was clearly nothing wrong with it. Edward was simply determined to make an obnoxious spectacle of himself. Throughout this horrendous dining experience, Edward kept name-dropping celebrities he supposedly knew intimately and bragging about his family's extreme wealth and status. According to him, he was best friends with various famous actors and musicians, and his father was a powerful CEO who had yachts and mansions all over the world. I highly doubt any of it was true, but Edward seemed desperate to impress me with his big shot connections and lavish lifestyle. In reality, he just came across as a shallow, egotistical jerk. By the time we finally left the restaurant, I was counting down the seconds until I could escape this nightmare of a day. But Edward had other plans. As we got back into his foul-smelling car, he suggested we get dessert somewhere else to continue the fun. I politely declined, claiming I wasn't feeling well and then just wanted to go home. Of course, he didn't listen. Edward proceeded to drive to an ice cream shop, insisting we at least get a scoop to eat on a nice nighttime stroll. At this point, I knew there was no use arguing or trying to end the date early. I had to ride it out to the bitter end. During the walk, Edward criticized my taste in TV shows, music, and movies, lecturing me on what quality entertainment really is. He then force played me songs from his favorite indie bands going on and on about how their lyrics spoke to his soul. Meanwhile, I was fantasizing about making a run for it. When we finally got back to my place, Edward had the audacity to ask if he could come inside to get to know me better. I quickly shut that down, saying I had an early morning and rushed to get out of his car. Now I'm hiding out in my apartment, praying he doesn't contact me again after that nightmare of an evening. What was I thinking of agreeing to go out with Edward from work? He seemed nice enough when he asked me out, but first impressions clearly can be deceiving. I should have trusted my gut. Edward turned out to be a pretentious snob with atrocious manners and questionable hygiene. Definitely not anyone I'd voluntarily spend time with again. At least now I have a hilarious disaster date story to share with my friends. We'd all got a good laugh dissecting everything that went wrong over mimosas at brunch, while I wanted to forget all about that awful experience. In hindsight, I can see the humor and just how epically bad it was. This was a valuable lesson, too. Next time a coworker asks me out, I won't be so worried about avoiding awkwardness that I ignore blatant red flags. My dating radar needs some fine-tuning, but at least now I can spot the obvious jerks. Edward is firmly in the no-second-date category. Here's hoping I never run into him again. Onward to better dating experiences. One day I'll look back and be grateful my relationship journey include a memorable fiasco like Edward. It will make meeting the right person someday even sweeter. For now, I'm perfectly content on my own, far away from men like him. 
I still remember how excited I felt when Alex asked me out on a date. We had met a few weeks prior on a popular dating app. His profile caught my eye. He was cute in a nerdy way, with curly black hair and bright blue eyes behind wire-rimmed glasses. His bio said he was a software engineer who enjoyed hiking, trying new restaurants, and cuddling up to watch sci-fi movies. It seemed we had a lot in common, so I swiped right. We started messaging and really hit it off. The conversation flowed easily between us. Alex was intelligent, but also funny and quirky. He asked thoughtful questions about my job, family, and hobbies. I found myself looking forward to his messages laying on my phone throughout the day. After two weeks of non-stop messaging, he finally asked me to dinner at a new Italian restaurant downtown. I immediately said yes, thrilled at the prospect of taking our digital chemistry into real life. The day of the dinner date, I was a ball of nervous excitement. I must have tried on six different outfits before settling on a casual black dress, classy but not overly dressy. I spent way too long on my hair and makeup, wanting to look perfect but natural. This was the first date I had been truly excited about in months. When I arrived at the restaurant, Alex was waiting by the hostess, Tim looking just as cute as his pictures. He broke into a warm, slightly crooked smile when he saw me, his eyes lighting up. He greeted me with a quick hug and complimented my dress. I could already feel a slight spark between us as the hostess led us to a small table near the back of the bustling restaurant. We started off with some awkward small talk, commenting on the delicious bread basket and decor. I could tell Alex was nervous too by the slight trembling of his hands as he asked me about my job and family. But after we ordered a bottle of red wine and the conversation drifted to travel and books, we both began to relax and open up. The more we chatted, the more I realized how perfectly Alex seemed to fit me. He was wit smart, but also silly, making me laugh with funny childhood stories and terrible puns. He was a great listener. His bright blue eyes focused intently on me as I told him about my passion for photography. Two hours slipped by as we bonded over our shared love of indie films and hiking. I was amazed at how comfortable and connected I felt, considering we had just met in person. After we finished eating, Alex suggested taking a walk through the park across the street. It was a beautiful warm summer night, the sun just beginning to set. The gravel paths were lit by old-fashioned street lamps and fireflies flickering around us. It felt romantic and magical, like something out of a movie. At one point during our leisurely stroll, Alex lightly grabbed my hand. I thrilled at even that gentle contact, feeling like giggling schoolgirl with her first crush. When we reached a stone bathroom pavilion, Alex excused himself for a minute. I found an empty bench nearby to relax and wait, setting my purse down next to me. As I checked my phone for any messages, I realized I had left my purse completely unattended for almost five minutes before Alex returned. In my dreamy state, it didn't even dawn on me that was more than enough time for someone to steal from it. Over the next few days, Alex kept casually messaging me, suggesting ideas for a second date. I happily agreed, floating on air that our connection seemed real and had potential. Then I started getting alarming notifications from my bank about strange, fraudulent charges to my credit card. Over $2,000 had been stolen in the last two days on expensive electronics and gift cards. My heart dropped as I realized what must have happened. Alex had swiped my credit card from my purse during those few brief minutes at the pavilion. He had seemed so genuinely interested in me that I fell for his act completely. I felt like such an idiot for leaving my bag unattended and trusting this stranger so easily. He clearly was only after my financial information, putting on a charming facade to get close and take advantage. I canceled my card immediately, but the damage was already done. I filed a police report, but they said chances were slim the thief would ever be found. The bank thankfully returned my stolen funds after confirming I hadn't made the fraudulent purchases. But I was left feeling so betrayed and angry, my hopes for romance crushed. It took me a long time to start dating again after that nasty experience. I no longer gave out personal details early on and kept my purse glued to my side at all times on dates. It taught me the hard lesson that you truly never know someone's motivations, even when they seem trustworthy. Alex's smooth charm and intellect were all part of an act to lower my guard and deceive me. I'm thankful I avoided any real physical danger, but the blow to both my finances and optimism stung deeply. In time, with restored caution and wisdom, I did eventually get back out there. 
and despite that early bump in the road, I'm happy to say my dating life took a turn for the better. The next charming, nerdy guy I met turned out to be truly worthy of opening up to. The spark we felt led to real love. He is now my husband and the father of my children. My trust in others wavered after Alex, but did mend, and I will never again make the mistake of leaving my purse unattended on a first date. I met Josh on a dating app a few months ago. His profile was intriguing, attractive photos showing his love of travel and the outdoors, a witty bio that made me laugh out loud. We started messaging and really hit it off. He was charming, flirty, and we seemed to have so much in common for our taste in books and movies to our life goals and sense of humor. After weeks of texting and phone calls that stretched late into the night, I felt like I knew him so well already. When Josh finally asked me out on a real date, I was thrilled. He suggested going to a house party his friends were throwing out in the countryside. I'd never been to that area before, but Josh made it sound fun and chill, a relaxed way for us to hang out together in person for the first time without too much pressure. I happily agreed, already looking forward to spending an evening with him. The day of the date, we texted back and forth eagerly making plans. Josh offered to pick me up and drive us both there. I spent way too long getting ready, wanting to live my best. Nerves and excitement twisted together in my stomach as I waited for him to arrive. Finally, his car pulled up outside. I locked up my apartment and climbed in beside him, flashing a bright smile. Josh looked even better than his photos. But as he smiled back, I noticed the smile didn't quite reach his eyes, which darted around, almost anxiously. He seemed distracted as we drove off, only making minimal small talk. I chalked it up to first date jitters, figuring he was just a bit nervous like I was. As we left the city behind, the suburbs slowly gave way to increasingly rural surroundings. Buildings became more scattered, roads narrower and darker with oppressive trees on either side. I kept waiting for Josh to turn off onto a side street, but he just kept driving further into the countryside. With an uneasy glance at the clock, I realized we'd already been driving for over an hour. I had no idea where we were anymore. Josh still seemed distracted, his hands gripping the steering wheel tightly. I was starting to get a bit creeped out. Where the hell was this party? Why drive so far? Finally, Josh slowed the car and turned onto a long gravel driveway nearly obscured by the dense woods pressed close on either side. The dark tree line finally opened up into a clearing dominated by a hulking old farmhouse. No other cars, no signs of life or a party. My mind reeled trying to make sense of the situation as I stared at the ominous house. I'd made a terrible mistake coming out here. Before we go in, there's something I need to tell you, Josh said seriously, turning to face me. This isn't a normal party. It's a gathering for a special spiritual group I'm part of. He must have sensed my alarm because he quickly continued. I know it sounds crazy, but ever since we started talking, I felt a connection with you, like you're meant to be part of this too. Tonight is an important ceremony and I want you to join. Will you come with me? His intense gaze bored into me. My head spun with shock and confusion. I had so many questions. My gut told me to get out of there, to demand he take me home. A spiritual group, I heard enough horror stories about cults to be wary. But beneath the fear, I felt a dark lure of forbidden curiosity. What exactly was going on here? I had to know. Propelled by a surreal sense of dreamlike unreality and morbid fascination, I slowly got it. Josh looked relieved as we got out of the car and approached the old house looming in the darkness. I could hear an eerie, rhythmic chanting emanating from inside. With one last encouraging smile, Josh opened the door. The chanting stopped as every eye turned to stare at us. The room was dim and hazy with incense smoke. About twenty people stood in a circle wearing dark hooded robes. A rough stone altar stood in the center, adorned with candles and strange symbols. I suppressed a chill of primordial fear. What had I gotten myself into? An imposing older man with a long gray beard stepped forward smiling at Josh and clasping his shoulder like a proud father. Then he turned to me, his ice-blue eyes glinting in the candlelight. I felt pinned under his penetrating stare like a bug on display. He reached for my hands and I let him take them, as if in a trance. Welcome, child. Your presence here tonight is the fulfillment of a great destiny. You have been chosen. Come, take your place in the circle for your initiation. His deep, 
hypnotic voice reverberated through me as he drew me forward. This had to be a bizarre dream. The hooded figures closed in around me, their droning chant rising in speed and volume as I stood rooted in the center. My heart raced as I looked at Josh in rising panic, but he just nodded encouragingly. What now? Part of me wanted to run to push through the bodies and escape into the night, but I was paralyzed, morbidly transfixed. This was really happening. The leader drew an ornate dagger, dipped it in a silver chalice, and turned to me, chanting in some weird language. I squeezed my eyes shut and waited for the sting of the blade, the warm rush of blood. I felt the cold metal on my skin and then white hot pain as he sliced my palm. He turned it downward, squeezing so that my blood dripped into the chalice as I fought the urge to cry out. The initiation is sealed in blood. You are now one of us, bound to the circle for eternity. He raised the chalice high and the others broke out in triumphant shouts and applause. I stood there stunned, cradling my bleeding hand, still not quite believing what was happening as Josh swept me into a tight embrace. The ceremony over, the moon shifted abruptly. The group took up a festive, almost ecstatic air as they shed their robes and led me out back where a huge bonfire roared. They began to dance and sway in wild abandon to pulsing drums. Part of me longed to flee, to find my way out of this nightmare. But I was in shock, unmoored from reality, and the pull of the atavistic drumbeat and writhing bodies was hypnotic. As if under a spell, I let myself be carried along in the dark tide of the night, losing myself in the dance, in the flames, in Josh's gleaming eyes as a strange new world opened up before me. I was really excited for my date with Angelina. We had matched online a few weeks ago and had been chatting nonstop ever since. She was witty, had similar interests as me, and seemed really sweet. The icing on the cake was when she told me she looked just like Angelina Jolie, that it was a coincidence that they had the same name. I was floored that a woman who looked like a celebrity would be interested in me. Leading up to the date, we talked on the phone a few times, and she seemed to have such an amazing personality to match her purported good looks. I started picturing our entire future together with this gorgeous, funny woman. I know I was getting ahead of myself, but on paper she just seemed too good to be true. When the big night finally arrived, I took extra care getting ready. I showered, shaved, styled my hair, and put on my best date outfit dress shirt, nice jeans, dress shoes. I wanted to make a good first impression. I even bought a new bottle of Kalan to set the mood. Spritzing it on, I daydreamed about how smoothly the night was going to go and how jealous my friends would be when I told them about my hot date. I arrived at the restaurant and eagerly told the hostess I was meeting Angelina. Right this way, she said, leading me through the crowded tables. My heart was pounding in anticipation. We rounded the corner and that's when I saw her waving me over from a booth. Except, it wasn't the Angelina I had expected at all. The woman sitting there was probably twice the size of the skinny girl in the photos. She looked frumpy in ill-fitting clothes and no makeup. My steps faltered for a second as I tried to process this. Was I at the wrong table? No, as I got closer she stood up and introduced herself as Angelina. I faked a polite smile and it shook her hand. Nice to meet you. In person, I said, trying to hide my shock. We sat down across from each other and an awkward silence ensued. I was reeling. This woman looked absolutely nothing like the Angelina Jolie-esque photos. We made stilted small talk about the weather and mundane topics. The conversation was nothing like our usual banter online. I could hardly focus as I kept stealing glances sideways, comparing her to the stunning, slim brunette I had envisioned. When the waiter came over, I stammered as I ordered, not knowing what to do in this situation. Should I confront her about the misleading pictures, make an excuse and leave, or just try to suffer through this mismatch over dinner? As the night dragged on, I felt duped. I was no longer having a good time and I was sure she could sense that. I started fidgeting and debating whether I could make a quick escape to the restroom and never come back. Finally, I just had to say something. In as polite a tone as I could muster, I told Angelina, I'm sorry, but I don't think we're a good match. I'm going to settle up and head home. She looked mortified, but tried to protest. My pictures are just a little outdated, that's all. Please give me a chance, she pleaded. But I had already made up my mind. I called for the check, paid quickly, and said goodbye. The whole drive home, I fumed over the situation. How could someone so blatantly lie about their appearance? 
It felt like she had catfished me and was a totally different person than the one I had been talking to for weeks. What a waste of my time and emotional investment. In the aftermath, I felt disillusioned about online dating. I was hesitant to chat with any new people for a while, worried I would be deceived again. When I finally did muster the courage to try again, I made sure to do video calls first to confirm my identities. No more taking people's profiles at face value. Looking back now, the evening with Angelina was certainly an ill-fated mismatch, but also a valuable life lesson. It taught me that appearances aren't everything and people don't always portray themselves honestly online. I learned to manage my expectations and not idolize someone before meeting face to face. I still cringe when I recall the awkward tension at that table with a practical stranger, but the experience protected me from wasting any more time on people who aren't. Forefright. It reminded me to always listen to my instincts, even if it means making an early exit from an uncomfortable situation. While I hope to never repeat that kind of first date, it served as an important crash course in online dating. It kept me grounded about balancing fantasy with reality. Moving forward, I would be more cautious and discerning, but it also inspired me to hold out for someone genuine inside and out. The catfish did me a favor. I was now ready to seek a true connection unhindered by superficial factors. The search continues, but I'm confident I'll know authenticity when I see it. And oh yeah, I won't believe the celebrity lookalike thing until I see it for myself. I never expected my blind date with Jamie to take such a twisted turn. When we first matched on Tinder, everything seemed promising. Jamie was attractive, funny, and we had great chemistry texting back and forth. I was excited but nervous as I got ready that evening, taking extra care with my hair and outfit, wanting to make a good first impression when we finally met in person. The date started off well enough, if a bit awkward as most first dates are. We met up at a cozy Italian restaurant downtown that Jamie had suggested. The conversation flowed easily as we sipped red wine and made small talk about our jobs, hobbies, favorite shows, and families. Jamie was so charming and flirty, lavishing me with compliments on my smile and laugh. I hadn't been on a date in a while and was really starting to like this witty, attractive person sitting across from me. Maybe this could really go somewhere. But then halfway through the entrees, just as I was letting my guard down, Jamie's face suddenly turned serious. Apologizing sheepishly, Jamie pulled out a phone and showed me the screen. My jaw dropped. It was a live stream of us right now sitting at our intimate corner table. The camera angle looked like it was secretly filming from a jacket buttonhole or something. I watched in disbelief as comments flooded in from viewers, judging my appearance, clothes, mannerisms, and our interactions. Jamie explained it was all just part of a social experiment for a popular YouTube channel and that the hidden camera stream had been capturing the whole day from the beginning without my knowledge or consent. I felt so violated and lied to. How could Jimmy do this to me? Was anything about our connection real? When I got angry, Jamie apologized profusely but insisted we had to keep the date going now as if it was no big deal. Apparently, the online audience was hooked now and demanding more content since it had gone viral. Jamie tried to downplay it all, offering to buy me more wine and dessert whenever I wanted, as if that could smooth things over. My head spun as I processed the fact that what I thought was a private date had actually been broadcast to who knows how many strangers online this entire time. Against my better judgment, I didn't get up and leave right then like I should have. I was in shock and morbidly curious where this bizarre situation would go, so I reluctantly agreed to continue the date, feeling like I no longer had much of a choice with all those eyes on me now. From there, things quickly spiraled out of control. The live stream viewers started voting and commenting on what Jamie and I should do next. Their dares and suggestions grew bolder and more demeaning. First, it was just goofy stuff like arm wrestling each other or trading embarrassing childhood stories. But then it escalated to the audience pressuring me to chug my glass of wine or to go around the restaurant trying to steal salt and pepper shakers from other tables while Jamie filled it all with gleeful encouragement. At one point, the viewers demanded we go outside to the street and ask invasive, inappropriate questions to strangers, seeing how many we could get to answer. I noticed a disturbing number of the commanders were men who seemed to be getting off on watching my discomfort. It felt like I was becoming a puppet for their amusement. I played along at first, not wanting to make a scene, 
but I was getting more upset, anxious, and uncomfortable with each humiliating, boundary-pushing dare. It seemed like the audience was just trying to engineer drama and conflict for their own entertainment without any regard for how it made me feel. They thrived on my authentic reactions. Meanwhile, Jimmy kept glancing at the stream and reading comments aloud, seeming to get more excited and manic with every like and new viewer, completely oblivious to how messed up the whole thing was. The final straw was when someone watching typed in all caps that Jamie should flip a table at the restaurant. My heart stopped as I watched Jamie actually stand up with a wild look like they were about to do it. Enough was enough. I mustered my courage, looked Jamie dead in the eyes, and calmly but firmly told the camera that I was done with this cruel game. Then I walked out with my head held high, leaving a stun to Jamie behind. The stunt they pulled was unforgivable. As I drove myself home, and shaking slightly on the wheel from adrenaline. All I could think was that I dodged a major bullet. I felt like I'd barely escaped a dangerous situation that could have ended up much worse. I went into the date hoping to maybe make a real human connection and instead had my trust betrayed and got objectified and manipulated for views. I'm just glad I got out of there when I did before Jamie or the toxic audience could pressure me into doing something I really wasn't okay with and would regret. It was a hard lesson to learn but I'll be way more careful in the future about who I trust and agree to meet up with in person. Things clearly aren't always how they seem. I'm just grateful to be home safe now after the night took such a dark turn. Definitely going to be way more cautious about online dating going forward. I was super excited, but also really nervous for my first date with Brad. We had matched online a few weeks ago and had been chatting nonstop ever since. He was so charming over text that when he finally asked me out to dinner, I couldn't wait to meet him in person. We decided to meet up at the restaurant he had picked out, a fancy steakhouse downtown that I had heard rave reviews about, but could never justify going to on my budget. I almost suggested we do something more low-key for a first date, like coffee or drinks, but Brad insisted on taking me somewhere nice to treat me right, and I have to admit I was flattered. No guy had tried to impress me like that before. I spent way too long getting ready, changing my outfit like five times. I finally settled on a cute but casual dress and flats. Didn't want to look like I was trying too hard. Brad had already been waiting when I got to the restaurant and waved me over enthusiastically. He looked just like his photos, tall with a bright smile. I was relieved there was no catfishing happening. Brad greeted me with a long hug and said I looked amazing. Such a gentleman already. The hostess quickly seated us at a cozy table. I opened the menu and almost gasped when I saw the prices. Even the cheapest meals were over $40. I shot Brad a hesitant look, but he smiled and told me not to worry about cost at all. Despite his reassurances, I stuck to one of the mid-range chicken dishes. Meanwhile, Brad ordered this huge, expensive porterhouse steak and a bottle of wine for the table that was more than some entrees. I sipped the wine nervously throughout the meal, keeping one eye on the waiter. In the back of my mind, all I could think about was the bill growing bigger and bigger. But Brad was great at keeping the conversation flowing throughout dinner. He asked me thoughtful questions about my job, family, interests. Nothing too, too personal, but enough to get to know each other. He was well-spoken and witty, too. Under different circumstances, I could see myself really liking this guy. Finally, the meal was over, and the waiter came by with a black folder containing a check. He discreetly handed it to Brad, who barely glanced at it before passing it back. I managed to catch a glimpse of the total before he closed the folder, $478 after tax and tip. That was easily half my rent. My stomach sank. How was I going to afford this? Should I put it on a credit card and pay off little by little? Just as I was mentally calculating my budget, Brad got a funny look on his face. Uh-oh, I think that wine went right through me. Be right back. Before I could say anything, he rushed off towards the restrooms. I sat there awkwardly, waiting for what felt like an eternity. Where did he go? Did he have explosive diarrhea or something? After ten minutes, I asked the waiter if maybe the men's room was out of order, but he said it was empty according to another server who had just checked. Now they both looked at me with apprehension. My leg bounced nervously under the table. The waiter headed back to the restroom area while I waited, trying not to assume the worst. After a few more agonizingly long minutes, he came back holding the empty wine glass, with a guilty look on his face. Sorry, missed, but it seems your date has left the restaurant through the back exit. My jaw dropped. 
Brad ditched me and stuck me with this ridiculous bill. I was speechless, utterly shocked that anyone could do something so awful and humiliating on a first date. The manager hurried over, looking very apologetic about the situation. I shakily explained I didn't bring that kind of cash with me and didn't even know Brad's last name, since we had only met online. My face burned in embarrassment. Thankfully, the manager was so understanding. He told me not to worry and that the restaurant would cover the bill, as this wasn't the first time it had happened after meeting online. I still felt mortified and profusely apologized, though the staff were all so kind about it. The restaurant even called me a cab home on the house. As I rode home, I replayed the date over and over, wondering how I didn't see the warning signs. The fancy restaurant, ultra expensive meals, avoiding personal talk or last names. It all seems so obvious in hindsight. I resolved to be much more cautious moving forward with online dates. This was certainly a harsh lesson on protecting myself and paying attention to red flags, even from seemingly nice guys. When I finally got home, I immediately texted my friends to tell them all about the crazy night. As mortifying as it was, I knew I'd eventually look back and laugh at this story of my epic disaster first date. The kindness of the restaurant staff really restored my faith in humanity after Brad's deceit. I was certainly more appreciative of normal, drama-free dates after that. Overall, definitely a memorable first date for all the wrong reasons. But at least now I've got a pretty wild tale to tell at parties. We had been chatting for a few weeks after meeting on a dating app, and she seemed really cool. When she mentioned loving salsa dancing, I immediately suggested we go to the weekly Latin dance night at the community center downtown. I meticulously styled my hair in the mirror, wanting to look my best. Adriana's photos showed she was absolutely gorgeous with flowing dark locks and captivating eyes. Slipping on my favorite button-down shirt, I hoped I could keep up with her on the dance floor. My palms were sweaty as I walked up to her door, gently knocking while trying to calm my breathing. When Adriana opened the door, she took my breath away. Her beauty radiated as she gave me a dazzling smile. Hi. It's so nice to finally meet you in person, she said. Warmly, I stumbled over my words, mesmerized by how her eyes sparkled in the soft glow of the porch light. Adriana linked her arm through mine and led me towards the car. Her touch sent electric feeling up my spine. I knew this would be a night to remember. We arrive at the community center to find the dance in full swing. The room pulsed with booming salsa music and couples expertly twirling across the floor. Adriana squeezed my hand reassuringly, sensing my nervousness. Don't worry. Just follow my lead out there, she said with a playful wink. As we joined the crowd, I tried my best to mimic the intricate steps, but felt clumsy and self-conscious. Adriana was a patient teacher, gently guiding me and correcting my frequent missteps. That's it, feel the rhythm she encouraged. After a few songs, our movements began to flow in sync. Her body responded fluidly to my cues, our hips swaying perfectly together. Looking into Adriana's eyes, I forgot about the bustling room and got lost in our private dance. After what felt like hours but was likely only minutes, Adriana fanned herself and laughed. Woo, I need some water. I led her off the floor towards the refreshments, mesmerized by the glow on her face. I offered to grab us both drinks so she could rest for a moment. Making my way through the crowd, I felt lighter than air, like I was walking on clouds. As I filled our cups at the drink table, I glanced back towards where I had left Adriana waiting. My heart dropped into my stomach at the sight. As she was dancing intimately with a muscular man I didn't recognize, his large hands gripped her hips tightly as he leaned in close to whisper something in her ear. A surge of heat flushed through me as jealousy and anger took hold. I stormed back onto the dance floor with tunnel vision, oblivious to the swaying couples around me. Adriana's smile faded as I approached, taking in the fury on my face. Before I could speak, the man spun rapidly, shoving me hard in the chest. I stumbled backwards, splashing my drinks across the floor. The crowd gasped and parted around us. Back off, punk. She's with me now, the man growled, looming over me menacingly. I held up my hands, trying to defuse the situation. Hey, sorry I didn't mean to barge in. We're just dancing. My words trailed off as he stepped closer, fists clenched at his sides. His muscular frame was coiled tight, ready to strike. My heart pounded as I glanced around us, realizing we were encircled by a whispering crowd. In a flash, his hand clamped down on my wrist like a vice grip. I cried out in pain as he twisted my arm behind my back with brute force. 
His other hand wrapped around my throat, lifting me up onto my tiptoes. Adriana's distant pleas barely registered through the blood roaring in my ears. Black spots flooded my vision as my airway was crushed. Summoning all my strength, I thrust my head forward into his nose. A loud crunch pierced the air as he howled in pain, releasing me. I gulped oxygen, shoving through the crowd in a frantic daze. Bursting outside, the night air revived my senses. My legs. Carried me in a full sprint to my car. I peeled out of the parking lot, catching a glimpse of the man stumbling out the doors behind me, blood gushing down his face. I drove for miles in silence, hands shaking on the wheel as delayed panic set in. Pulling over on an empty road, I broke down, sobbing uncontrollably. The perfect date had collapsed into a nightmare in mere minutes. What if he had seriously hurt me, or followed me outside? Adriana's smiling face from earlier in the evening now seemed a cruel illusion. In the weeks after, I withdrew into myself, avoiding friends and calls from Adriana. Loud noises made me jumpy as vivid flashbacks overwhelmed me. I stopped using dating apps, too shaken to trust meeting strangers anymore. That horrific experience taught me an important lesson about listening to my instincts. Now at the first sign of any red flags, I walk away rather than ignore my intuition. Staying would have only risked greater harm. We have to be willing to make a scene to protect ourselves. Sometimes the only victory is escaping with your life. I had matched with her on a popular dating app a few weeks prior. Her profile picture showed a pretty, smiling brunette who looked to be in her late twenties, like me. Her bio painted her as an intelligent, ambitious young professional who enjoyed hiking, reading, and trying new restaurants. We connected right away over our shared love of horror films and indie music, and soon we were texting daily about everything under the sun. After several long phone calls getting to know each other even better, we finally decided to meet up in person. We planned to go to a trendy new bistro downtown that came highly recommended. I arrived early, wanting to secure us a good table where we could talk comfortably on our first date. The hostess greeted me with a perky smile and led me to a cozy corner booth at the back of the rustic chic restaurant. I slid into the cushioned seat, my nerves starting to bubble up now that this long-anticipated date was finally happening. I busied myself looking over the menu and sipping ice water, compulsively checking the time on my phone. Sarah was ten minutes late at this point, but I figured she was probably just stuck in traffic or having wardrobe indecision like anyone meeting a dating app match for the first time. After a few more minutes passed, I started to worry she might stand me up altogether. Just as I resolved to wait five more minutes before texting her, the door chimed signaling a new customer. I glanced up hopefully, only to feel my stomach drop. The disheveled, hollow-eyed woman who had entered looked nothing like the vibrant girl I had been messaging for weeks, though she appeared to be around. Sarah's age, her dingy clothes were torn and stained, her greasy hair hanging limply around her bruised face. She looked emaciated and unsteady on her feet as she hovered near the entrance scanning the restaurant. I prayed she wasn't who I thought she was, but her wandering eyes soon met mine. James, she rasped, shuffling over when I nodded hesitantly. Sorry I'm late, I'm Sarah. She attempted a smile as she lowered herself gingerly into the booth, but it came out as more of a pained wince. I sat stunned, unable to reconcile this clearly destitute woman with the charming, successful persona Sarah had presented online. She stared down at the table, refusing to meet my eyes as I tried to mask my confusion and surprise. I'm so sorry I don't look. Like my pictures, Sarah offered softly, her raw voice filled with shame. A lot has happened since then. I should have been honest with you. As the initial shock wore off, I felt a swell of empathy for this vulnerable, broken woman before me. Clearly there was a story here, and she needed someone to listen without judgment. I gently encouraged her to tell me the truth about who she was and what had brought her to this point. Haltingly, Sarah began to open up. She explained that the pictures on her dating profile were from two years prior, before her life had completely fallen apart. At that time, she was working as an executive assistant and living comfortably in a downtown apartment. But an abusive relationship with a controlling boyfriend led her to lose her job and home as he isolated her from friends and kept her in a constant state of fear and dependence. The abuse eventually escalated to physical violence, which gave Sarah the push she needed to finally flee. But with no money, family, or support system, she quickly ended up on the streets, 
To cope with the trauma and hopelessness of her new reality, she turned to bad stuff and alcohol. Before long, addiction had overtaken her life completely as she sunk deeper into poverty and despair. Sarah confessed that she used dating apps to scout men who might buy her a meal or give her cash to feed her habits. She admitted how ashamed she felt to resort to manipulating kind-hearted people when she used to have so much promise and opportunity for her. But the pills had control over her now, numbing her pain day after day, but taking everything else too. I sat quietly as she laid bare her deepest pains and regrets. Under the unwashed hair and tattered clothes was a human being who had been through unimaginable suffering and loss. Sarah was clearly intelligent and self-aware beneath her addiction and didn't want this life for herself. What she needed was someone to show her compassion and remind her that she still had value as a person. I realized then that our meeting that night might not have been chance. I knew I couldn't single-handedly save Sarah, but if I could rekindle even a flicker of hope in her, it would be worth it. We continued our date, sharing the meal I had ordered earlier as I learned more of her story. I gave her the cash I had withdrawn before the date, making her promise to consider getting help and telling her I was there if she ever needed to talk. When we finally parted ways that night, Sarah thanked me through her tears. She said knowing someone saw her as a human being again meant more than I could understand. I left our strange first date shaken, but also with a renewed sense of empathy for those who have fallen on hard times. I never heard from Sarah after that, and I still wonder if she was able to claw her way out of the darkness that had consumed her. Our brief encounter reminded me that compassion and understanding for others can go a long way, even if you never see the results. Behind the ragged clothes and addiction was a sensitive soul just needing someone to care. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.